So our keynote today uh, is brought in special for you all for your listening entertainment. One of a very tiny group of people, Ben Radford is a professional paranormal investigator working on the side of science and reason. He's been interviewed on just about every media outlet that has existed in his career. He has written thousands of investigative articles over his career for many different publications, Yahoo News, Discovery News, Life Science, for for Two and Times, Open Society Magazine, <coughs> Free Inquiry, and many, many more, and one of my favorites, Snopes. He's also contributed to Snopes.com. He's also a research fellow for the Skeptical Inquirer magazine, as uh, don't forget to pick up your copy in the back and subscribe. Um, and, <coughs> sorry, I'm not sure I can do the list of topics he's covered any justice, but I'm gonna try. Psychics, ghosts, exorcisms, miracles, Bigfoot, stigmata, lake monsters, UFOs, reincarnation, crop circles, urban legends, Amityville horror, conspiracies, mass hysteria, Pokemon panic. Okay, so you guys get the idea. Ben is a board game developer. He's an artist. He writes and directs film. And he's also an author of many books, including Lake Monster Men's Mysteries, Tracking the Chupacabra, The Martians Have Landed, Mysterious New Mexico, and in 2016, Bad Clowns, which kept him so busy giving interviews all over the world after the October scary clown ex epidemic. So you can see why we brought him to come talk to you. Um, Ben's first pet was a dog named Roller Flat. He named him himself, can you tell? Ben will be speaking twice today. First, he's going to give you an overview, and he's going to talk for about 30 minutes right now. And you can talk to him during lunch and purchase his books right there in the back and uh, pick up some of his cards, and beautiful artwork from a friend of ours as well. And then at the end of the conference, you can talk to him again. We're going to, as I said, we're going to go over to Blaze Pizza and celebrate the end of Skeptic Camp and plan the next Skeptic Camp while we're there. So, all the way from Albuquerque, New Mexico, we bring you Ben Rafford. Thank you, Susan. I, I, I'm, I was like, over there, like, wow, it sounds like she's describing someone else. Like, where did you get that bio? Did you make that up? Because, you know. Wikipedia. Oh, if there, you can't trust Wikipedia, you know. You so. can't trust that. Answer exactly. the question. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you all for, for coming out uh, to, uh, to Skeptic Camp and also, of course, to, to Susan and Robin Wilson and the rest of the Skeptic Camp community and the Monterey Skeptics. Uh, it's a. Uh, I'm primarily a writer, and I also I'm also the uh, deputy editor of Skeptical Inquirer Science Magazine, which again, free uh, back there. Uh, take a look. Yes, it's a fine a fine magazine. I'm I'm proud to have been there for 17 years. Uh, oddly enough, um, and so uh, it, it's because most of what I do is writing, investigating. It can be sort of insular. I spend time sort of hunched over my my computer and the cat will paw at me and demand attention and I'll push it away and then, uh, but, uh, yeah, her, Zivon, my cat. Um, but uh, I, I do, one of the things I really enjoy uh, is coming to speak to, to, to uh, groups like this. I also talk at uh, colleges and universities and schools because uh, I, I, I like the interaction. I like talking to the people, I like to hear what you guys are interested in and, and you know, getting questions. Uh, some are, you know, more intelligent than others. I'm expecting good questions. Uh, if we have time at the end, or you, you can corner me in the back. Uh, but uh, I want to begin by talking about um, about applied um, applied skepticism. Now, uh, as you can see, there's the little seal that says Monterey County Skeptics. Um, I know that many of you in this room are skeptic, but not all of you are. Um, hopefully, there's some outreach, and we have some new people. So I don't want to assume that we all know what a skeptic is. Uh, even within the skeptical community, we don't know what the hell we're doing, <laughs> or we can't always agree on what a skeptic is. So let me let me talk a little bit about that. Uh, and as Susan mentioned, I will be giving a, a second talk this afternoon, and I'll be focusing more on media criticism. Uh, I have written uh, several books on media criticism, including Media Mythmakers. There's I think one copy left back there. We talked to some about that as well. Um, and let me just give a quick bio in, in terms of, you know, she mentioned some of the stuff that I do. My background is actually, I have a degree in psychology and a master's in education. Uh, as Susan mentioned, I've been a writer and investigator for many, many years. Um, and I, I sort of cross the line between doing media criticism, uh, public education, things like that, 
so, um, and I've been on all sorts of TV shows. Uh, in fact, next week, CNN wants me to fly to Atlanta to talk to them about um, viral bad clown videos. Uh, yes, and I'm the guy that wrote the book on bad clowns uh, and chupacabras. So, uh, it's, it's, I was talking to my friend the other day, he says, you know, your obituary is going to be weird. <laughs> it's like, you know, I don't mean to get, I don't mean to get, but, you know, turn, turn you out know, to, to, to take this south, but uh, it's going to mention chupacabras, the Hispanic vampire race, of course, and evil clowns. He said, most people can't say that. Like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's good, but I'll, I'll, what am I going to do at this point, right? Except for try to top myself. We'll see how that goes. Um, but so I want to talk briefly about, about what skepticism is and, and where I sort of fit into this. Skepticism um, is, uh, I, I, I have people corner me and say, well, what exactly is a skeptic? What, what does that mean? You, you, you doubt things? Like, well, we all doubt things. I mean, you know, it, it's not simply a matter of doubting things. Skeptics and skepticism is a matter of asking for evidence, whatever, whatever the claim may be. And so, for example, for the Center for Inquiry, uh, the organization I work for, we ask for evidence on a wide variety of things, uh, from weird things such as ghosts to slightly less weird things such as alternative medicine, homeopathy, uh, homeopathic... Uh, uh, what, you know, what dangerous stuff over there, depending on whether you believe it or not. Uh, but it, it's really, so the skepticism that, that I practice as a personal philosophy, if you will, is really applies across the board. So I don't just, it's not the sort of uh, skepticism that only applies to ghosts or only applies to this or that. It's, it's really anything that people want you to believe, the question is, why do you want me to believe it? Right? Maybe politicians, advertisers. Um, people who claim to have psychic powers, well, whatever it might be, my answer is, sure, I'm happy to believe it. Give me a reason to believe it. I, I, don't, I don't doubt you, off, you know, right off the gate. I'm happy to hear what you have to say, but you have to provide evidence. You know, right? the, the burden of proof lies with the claimant. So skepticism is not simply just doubting things, because, again, there's all things, we all doubt something, right? It's, it's, really, it's really essentially demanding evidence uh, and in, in, in one case, for example, the, the famous um, aphorism is extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Uh, Carl Sagan popularized it and, and others as well. And that's sort of the, the, the general theme of, of what, uh, what we do. Um, and, and of course, there's lots of people, lots of uh, philosophical skeptics. Uh, David Hume is, of course, uh, uh, among them. Uh, he's mentioned somewhere, I think, uh, other Cicero. Uh, Hume's, Hume's on, down the bottom. Also, Paul Kurtz, who I, um, who I worked with for many years at, at our um, offices in, in Buffalo. And uh, that's all well and good. Uh, I'll be honest that some of, this, uh, some of the philosophical stuff sort of makes my eyes glaze over. Uh, with, with, all, with all apologies to the philosophers, I, I, I find it interesting up to a point after a while, like, okay, yes, we got it. I'm more interested in where the rubber hits the road. I'm more interested in, okay, we have this idea of skepticism. We have this notion that, that, that if you're going to ask me to believe some claim, advertising claim, ghost claim, whatever it is, I want evidence for it. And so I'm interested in, okay, well, how do we take that, 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 that idea and apply it to everyday, or sometimes not everyday, weird things that people believe? Bigfoot, ghosts, chupacabras, crop circles, what have you, miracles. And that's, that's, that is sort of the applied skepticism that I do, and, and others do as well. Joe Nickel, Massimo Paolo Doro, Richard Wiseman, there's, there's others as well. But it is, it is sort of a small subset of the skeptical community. And that's, that's sort of one of my specialties. Uh, I've written 10 books. I've got, I think, five or six back there. I've got another one. Actually, if I weren't in front of you talking, I'd be back at home with, with my cat pawing at me, trying to get me to uh, not finish my next book. But there it is. Uh, so, so you know, where, 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 where does this come from? Well, again, there's all sorts of claims out there, and what I try to do is I try to apply science uh, and skepticism to these topics. And I've had people say, well, hold on here. Well, you know, but, but psychics, that's, that's beyond science, right? That's, that's somehow, you, you, you can't use science to explore that, right? Of course you can. There's... Absolutely you can. Science is the prism through which we understand the world, right? That's how we know 
the composition of, of planets. That's how we that's how we identified you know the basis for germ theory. I mean, science is the prism through which we understand everything, and there's no reason to somehow put weird, so-called weird paranormal topics such as UFOs and ghosts and Bigfoot and chupacabras into some box. You know, you, you, know, you can't use it to look there. Of course you can. Open that thing up and look in there. And that's what I do. Uh, and much of what I do is interdisciplinary, which, which actually one of the things that I really enjoy about it is uh, I bring in forensics. I bring in uh, folklore. I'm a, I'm, a mem I'm a member of the American Folklore Society. And a lot of what I do is, is involves, there's usually a folkloric or urban legend aspect to all sorts of weirdness, pretty big ghost stories and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but again, I bring in all sorts of you know, forensic science. Um, uh, take your pick. I mean, there, there's so many mysteries out there that, for example, with cryptozoology or the, the search for unknown animals. I, I co-wrote a book on, on lake monsters with Joe Nickel, and there's also a Chupacabra book out there. Right, that includes what, what What's involved in that? Well, of course, anatomy, zoology, biology. Um, if, these, if these creatures are real, if Bigfoot's out there in the Pacific Northwest or anywhere else, then they have to be like ordinary animals, right? They have to mate, and they have to eat, and they have to die. And I mean, there's, there are real-world implications for these beliefs. And so this is where you sort of bring in this multidisciplinary approach, and so that's, that's, that's really the way that I, I approach it. And another thing this, that distinguishes uh, what I do is I actually try to solve the mystery. Now, that may seem kind of obvious, but what you find is that oftentimes uh, the people that you see on television or you see writing books, they don't really want to solve the mystery. They want to promote the mystery. They want to promote the weird and the woo and the mystery mongering. This is why uh, you see all these all these TV shows, you know, Ghost Hunters and, and Fighting Bigfoot. Still, not, still found Bigfoot. Uh, ghost Hunters uh, still in their in their I think 11th season of not finding ghosts. Um, it's just remarkable these things you can stay on there. I mean, I, I can't get it. You know, I, I can't get a whole TV series of like yeah, looking for and not finding things. You know, Ghost Hunter failure season five. Anyway, uh, but the the. What distinguishes what I try to do in my approach is that, again, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. And if, whether the subject is, is monsters or, or, or ghosts or someone's you know, alien abduction, whatever it is, my question is, what's really going on here? If the answer is that it's something paranormal, great! That's awesome! I want to I wanna be there. I want to be there when they find the chupacabra and then the, the Bigfoot. I want to be there when somebody makes this Dell laptop computer rise into the air, spin around, and back down with their mind. I want to be there to see that, record that, test that, smell it, taste it, whatever it is. I, I, that would be cool to me, right? So, so my approach is not debunking. I often debunk claims in the process of investigating them, but my goal is not to dismiss or disprove, my goal is to figure out what's going on there. And if the answer is, this thing is real, all the better. And, that's, and so that, that's really the, the approach that I take, and, and you know, if, in, in several of my books, I, I devote in-depth chapters to those, because in my mind, the process of investigation is, in many ways, not only as interesting, if not more interesting, than, than the sort of, you know, the, the big headline mystery story, it's also informative. You can see the process by which these, these phenomena are, are investigated and using science. Um, and the other, the other aspect, the other thing that just distinguishes uh, skeptical and scientific investigation is we actually solve mysteries. This, this is an important distinction that's often lost in the public. Is, uh, is, is again, as I mentioned, there's all these TV shows, these books, these experts, they go around and they, they talk about their, their psychic powers, their alien abductions, whatever it is, and there, there's this continual, they, they never, they never, there's never a conclusion, right? They don't actually prove that Bigfoot exists. They don't actually prove that ghosts exist. It's, it's all sort of promises and smoke and mirrors. Whereas if you look at the body of work uh, d done by investigative skeptics, uh, myself included, you actually find Solutions. You actually find, hey, we figured out what this was. This was not a ghost. This was not X, Y, Z. 
so far, and who knows, it could be that next year, or next month, or 10 years from now, we will actually find these. And if so, that's great. I, I'm, again, I'm, I'm not trying to debunk them, I'm trying to figure out what they are. But that's, that's an important distinction, is that the, 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 in the skeptical literature, oftentimes you do find solutions, you actually find conclusive, proven, like, yeah, this is what this was. Uh, whereas in the believer, in the believer or mystery monument literature, it's sort of like, well, you know, maybe one day we'll find out. Mm -hmm. Do you may here know the, the the magazine Fate? I'm sure some, yeah, okay, a couple of nods. So Fate magazine, is still published. It's been around since I think the 30s, if I'm not mistaken. And I was looking the other day at, at, at an old issue. It was like, I think it was August 1952. I was looking through it, and there's a story on psychics, and it said, uh, it's like, well. We all know that within five years, psychic power will be known to exist. And by the turn of the century, people will routinely be teleported. It's just totally like, well, there's just this evidence horizon that somehow never came. I'm like, I want to write to that probably long dead. It's like, yeah, so that thing there, and I'll, you see the same thing, whether it's, you know, UFO abductions. They say, you know, evidence for UFOs is just around the corner. Any day now, we're going we're gonna to get that. Like, oh. August 43. All right then. <laughs> Let me know how that goes. Anyway, so I, that's sort of the, a little bit of an overview there. I want to talk a little bit about um, about uh, beliefs uh, because essentially that's that's that is at the core of, of what we're talking about. As I mentioned, that degree in psychology, and that's that really informs my uh, my the, the way I approach these things. And when I interview our witnesses, whatever the witnesses are. I, I, I treat them with courtesy and respect because I want to know what, they're, what they experience. Now, we may differ in terms of the explanation. That is, the person may genuinely believe that their dog is psychic or that they were... Uh, don't laugh, I've, I've heard... I've, 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 I talk to weird people, let me tell you. <laughs> the emails that I get, I, I, I mean, ask me afterwards, I'll, show you, I'll share a few of them for you. Uh, but it, yeah, somehow my email gets out, and I, get, I just get the weirdest stuff. I, I can't even tell you. And, and hate mail and death threats, actually. Um, uh, yeah, people get people get create. Actually, the worst ones are the the, the worst ones are the, the conspiracy theorists. I get more hate mail and and not not often, but occasional death threats, usually from conspiracy theorists because they're very vehement. They they believe that I am actively covering up some something that, that the world needs to know. And so I'm the enemy. And whereas if, if someone comes to me and, and they have a difference of opinion, my approach is, all right, let's talk about it. Like, you believe that? Okay, what's your, what's your thought process? What's your evidence? I'm interested in that. I, I don't assume that they're lying to me. Whereas on the other side of the coin, their assumption is that I am lying. I'm either, I'm either too stupid, I'm, I'm the sheeple, right? I, I, I bought into, I drank the Kool-Aid and I'm just parroting the line. Uh, so I'm, I'm really too stupid to really waste their time with because I just I believe everything I, I see. Or the other the other alternative in their mind is that I'm actively trying to cover it up, that I, I'm part of the problem, that I'm trying to obfuscate the truth and hide things. And in either of those cases, I'm the enemy. I'm the bad guy. I'm either stupid or I'm a liar. And there's there's there is no third option. There is no you know what? Maybe we have different points of view. Maybe we're looking at different evidence. Maybe I know more about this than you do. Maybe I don't listen to Alex Jones every day. Who knows? You know, there's, there's all sorts of reasons why we may approach this in different ways. But it's just this, it, it's, and I think that's not to get too off topic, but I think that's one of, one of, the, one of the reasons why there is such antagonism, particularly uh, against skeptics, is because there is this inherent assumption that, that there is bad faith on our part. Anyway, when I, when I, when I talk to, 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 uh, to, to groups, it's interesting, I'll, 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 for example, go to university and I'll ask a class. I'm not going to ask you because this is a self-selected group of, of skeptics. See, sampling, guys, look it up. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll ask people, say, hey, you know, like, how many of you believe, uh, you know, if, in, in, say, ghosts? And then, okay, we got Leonard in the back. Leonard will be talking about his experience <laughs> with ghosts. Uh, thank you, Leonard, very good there. Uh, but it's interesting because I often don't get a, a bell curve. I don't get the normal distribution. Instead, I get, I get something a little more curious. So what happens is that about 40% say, yeah, I believe in ghosts. Absolutely. Like, I, I grew up in a house with ghosts. My aunt? I mean, it, it, it's a matter of fact. It's like, 
Yeah, sure. I mean, my, my mother spoke to or her. I mean, they have some personal story, and they're they're like, yeah, sure. Another forty percent are like, really? You're that's a stupid. No, no, I don't believe in ghosts. This is absurd. This is what? This is such a stupid question. And then there's like a middle percent, maybe you know, maybe 20, 30 percent who are sort of on the fence about it. But it's this polarized response that I get. It's really interesting because. The, 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 to the topics we're talking about are ostensibly real or not, right? I mean, either ghosts exist or they don't. Either Bigfoot exists, or they will more, have more than one of them, or they don't. I mean, this isn't, it's not as if 51% of the public believes something, it suddenly appears, right? Or psychic powers, whatever it is. It's, this is not a matter of belief. This should be a matter of fact. And it should be, these are subjects that are in what in science we call falsifiable. We should be able to tell, I mean, you know, again, take, take the Loch Ness Monster. Either there, there are these creatures in this lake or there are not. You can test that. You can drain the damn lake. You can search the lake. And it has been searched repeatedly. But the point is that, that the, these theoretically are not, aren't issues of belief. It's not like, well, I believe it's like there, we all should be looking at the same evidence and coming with safe conclusions. But of course, that doesn't happen. <laughs> Instead, we all, we all look at the available evidence uh, through our own prisms, of course, right? This will go, could be come to, to, to psychology and confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. And you know, people, people see evidence, and you can present the same evidence to two different groups, and some people will say, they'll, they'll reject the evidence, like, well, that's faked, I don't believe it, uh, this is all conspiracy, people made that up. Or they'll just interpret the evidence, of course, to sort of align with whatever their pet theory is. Uh, but that's, that's really what I find is, is really interesting in terms of, you know, why, why do people believe these things? Um, you know, I have some stats here. 70% of people believe in angels. And this, these, are, uh, these are taken from a book called uh, Paranormal America, which is actually an interesting book came out about 10 years ago. Uh, if you're interested in, in beliefs, uh, Paranormal beliefs across different demographics, genders, and, and, and stuff is actually quite interesting. 53% claim they were personally saved by a guardian angel. 32% have felt an angelic presence. Now, presumably, these are people who believe in angels, right? I mean, if you don't believe in angels, then you would, maybe it's a ghostly presence or whatever else. So, there's, there's, again, it goes, it's really interesting when you start looking and parsing out the worldviews. Like, what... What assumptions do you have to hold in your head and your worldview to assume that this is an angelic presence or a miracle or whatever else? 33% uh, believe in communication with the dead. Uh, depending on the poll, 33% to 50% believe in ghosts, with 20% saying they personally experienced one. Here in America, in, I don't know, like 2012. So we're not talking Middle Ages Europe, we're talking here and now. Uh, and one, so there, there's a couple questions here. So why is there so much belief? Uh, and the answer, usually the answer that I hear is, because people are stupid. <laughs> That's not the correct answer. Actually, there are stupid people, and you know, let's be honest, we all know some. Um, but uh, the, the, the general answer that, well, people are stupid, no, no, that's, that's not actually correct. Um, the fact is that, that many people who hold these beliefs are actually quite smart people. Uh, they're, they're not, you know, they're, they're just sort of this, this uh, stereotype of the, you know, the, uh, the, the hick out in, 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 <laughs> in Kentucky backwoods who, you know, is abducted by an alien or may or may not get an anal probe, it's really none of my business, <laughs> consenting adults, whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, th there's this notion that the, the, the backwoods folks and, and, and you know, the, and there's also an interesting uh, um, sort of anti-intellectual tradition that I'm sure many of you have noticed, um, in which there's a sort of distrust of authorities, a distrust of scientists. Uh, and that's part of the problem, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later on today. But the, the, the bigger problem is not widespread stupidity, uh, although that is a slight problem. Uh, it's really low science literacy and critical thinking. And I, I have talks with skeptic friends of mine, and, uh, and occasionally we have to think, well, why, why, why don't people think more critically, right? Why, wh what's going on here? And I'm always shocked at that question, because my, my response is, 
Why would we expect people to think critically? Right? If you, if you walk down the street, you don't assume that someone walking by you is an accomplice cellist or an accountant or a doctor. You just don't. I mean, the, the, so there, there should not be an assumption that the average people w would think critically because critical thinking is an acquired skill. It's a talent. It's, it's something you have to study, you have to research. You, critical thinking does not come naturally to us. In fact, it's unnatural to us. Our, our brains are, are, are they use you know, heuristics and, and, and cognitive shortcuts that, that, are, that are often mislead us and stuff. So, so you know, the, the, the scientific process is not intuitive. In fact, it's often counterintuitive. Uh, and so there's so many ways in which our brains can mislead us in terms of in our, in our understanding the world. Again, I mentioned cognitive biases, and there's all sorts of ways in which our brains mislead us. And so, I mean, there are ways around it, and it's called critical thinking. And it's, it, there's, there are different avenues, different, there's different formulas, there's not, there's not one model. But the fact is that we don't teach critical thinking in schools. Um, on occasion, you'll get like some special seminar or something, but for the most part, critical thinking is not taught as a basis in schools. And in, in my opinion, uh, it should be the, that is, that is the basis through which you examine biology. That's, the, but that's how you examine history, geology, is, is through the prism of critical thinking. It underlies all these other topics, and, and the, typically the, the, the feeling seems to be, well, if we just teach them all these other things, maybe critical thinking will happen like by osmosis, right? If we just throw enough stuff at them, maybe, maybe this will sort of leak out and they'll be thinking critically. No, you have to teach people this. And because we don't teach it in schools, we shouldn't expect most people to 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 uh, to do that, and also of course, science can be confusing in, in all sorts of claims and counterclaims. Uh, you know, you, know you, you you see something on CNN where someone's talking about you know latest study says coffee will kill you, and then two months later, <laughs> coffee you know, you know coffee is a cancer fighter, and uh, there's reasons for that, and I can talk about that later on. But but you know, a lot of it is the the low level of science literacy not just among journalists, but among the, the, the public in general. So there, there could be some study, and if you look at it, I mean, there's an there's a N or a, there's, a, there's a, a study size of like 13. Like, well, really? You, you got your best friends out at, at Starbucks and this is what you came up with? I mean, there's so much junk science out there. And it's not necessarily that people are necessarily trying to, uh, trying to mislead people. It's just that there, there isn't a good level of, of literacy. I'll, I'll come back in a second. Um, so anyway, the, the point is that, that, you know, that it's not always obvious what's true and what's not true because we get conflicting, um, we get conflicting information, not only just among scientists, and in fact, I think, um, I think it was Glenn earlier talked about the, uh, uh, you know, scientists who have a hard time communicating with the public, and, right, and so you have, you have people who, who, if anybody needs to communicate, it, it's, it's scientists because they, you know, steeped in, in, in research and, and, and critical thinking in science, but oftentimes they don't, you know, they're, they're, they're giving, they're presenting papers to their, to their, their colleagues, and they're not going out there and trying to present it and, and to, to the general public, which is why um, Carl Sagan, who's mentioned twice on their wonderful book, and of course Neil, Neil Tyson in the bottom, uh, are so important, because they are science popularizers, and that's part of what, what we try to do uh, through the CSI and, and the skeptics group. I mean, there's, there's more to it, I don't have time to get into it, uh, but I want to sort of give sort of an overview. And one of the things that I, uh, oh, let me just tell you a, a quick story about, about the, um, <laughs> the, 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 the difficulties of, of uh, science uh, communication. Oftentimes in, in newspapers, um, you find that uh, the, uh, the, science, the, the science reporter that's assigned to a story, uh, he was covering basketball last week, <laughs> college basketball. In the off season, um, and so with the decline of newsrooms uh, in newspapers across the country, uh, you have you have fewer and fewer professional journalists, and you have people who are spread more and more thin. And so it's, it's not uncommon to have science uh, science stories being covered by people who have no particular background in science. They may be great journalists if they're covering local politics. Local politics and science are two different things. And I remember I got a call. I was, I was in Buffalo at the time, this was probably maybe, maybe 10, 10, 15 years ago. I got a call from a reporter 
Um, it was, in, I think, in Baltimore or Boston or something, and uh, the guy calls me up and he says, yeah, um, I understand you do research into unusual topics and this and that. I said, yeah. He says, well, do you know, what do you know about dowsing? It's like, it's like, sure, what do you want to know about dowsing? Uh, there are different types of dowsing. There's people who use the, the, uh, the L-shaped rods, the dowsing rods. There's pendulum dowsing. I was like, what do you want to know? He says, well, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm working on an article. We have a local guy. He's an older guy. He's like in, in his 70s, uh, beloved local guy. And he, uh, he says he can find uh, graves uh, through using dowsing. I was wondering if you could explain it. I'm like, well, uh, I guess. I'm, I'm reaching for my coffee, which is not there. I'm like, oh, all right. So I was like, okay, tell me, explain. He says, well, he, he, he goes to different places. Um, and uh, he, um, he, he finds uh, hidden graves. And I said, well, how, uh, you know, can you explain how he does it? And he says, well, uh, I said, where does he do this? Like in, in a park, in a parking lot? I mean, where is he? he says, no, 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 he, 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 uh, he does it in a, in a cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm trying to be polite. I was like, okay. Uh, uh, does, do the tombstones give it away? He's like, he's like, no, no, no. He says, no, you don't understand. He says, so he, he says, even when there's not a tombstone there. I was like, okay. So he says, he says, he, uh, he he's, you know, he's a, he's sort of a local eccentric guy, and he's, but he goes around and, he, and he's describing this to me. He says he goes around and, and he has the he has the dowsing rods, and he says, so what happens is that when, when he finds a grave, the the dowsing rods cross, and he's like, you know. And I said, you know, I mean, I, I, I know what you're speaking of. And he says, well, so how, how does he do that? And I said, well, I said, well, um, how do you know he finds the graves? And he says, well, the dowsing rods cross. <laughs> so I said, I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase this. Um, do you dig up the bodies? He's like, no. Okay, so, so how do you know that when the dowsing rods cross, he finds a grave? He's like, uh. oh. <laughs> he says, I'll, I'll call you back. <laughs> and I was just like, I'm like, oh God, really? Uh, but I, mean, I, was, I was trying to be, I was being polite, um, and I was, because to, to, to the reporter's credit, he did call an expert. I am an expert on a couple of weird minor things, including dowsing, and so to, to his credit, he did make an effort to contact somebody who knew about it and could provide a skeptical explanation. Uh, I never heard any more about it, and I have no idea what ever happened to him, but it was just like, really, did, did you not, nobody thought to, ah, uh, God. Anyway, let me just wrap up uh, by, uh, by saying, um, by, by um, imploring you all to participate in some way. Uh, sometimes when I when I give talks, I'm talking to people and, and they see me on a show or whatever else, and and they oh I, I really like what you do. This is really cool. You know I, I bought your books. Oh, there's books back there by the way. Um, and they're like hey this is really cool. Like how but it's like I but I don't I'm, you know I don't have a degree in psychology. I don't I don't I don't know that much about science. How how can I help? I said what do you do? He said well I'm a dentist. I said perfect, perfect. Why? Because there are claims. About, about dentistry that involve the, their paranormal claims. Uh, there are people who have all sorts of weird claims about stuff in your teeth. There's alternative medicine claims. He said, wow, I didn't know that. And I gave him a little list. And what I found is that, is that people who are interested in skepticism, people who are interested in critical thinking and, 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 and sort of helping to sort of spread critical thinking to people, whatever your subject is, teacher, accountant, uh, optometrist, whatever it is, I promise you, you can contribute. There, you, you may think, oh, I, I'm not an expert, I don't know this. It doesn't matter. Come talk to me. Tell me what you're interested in. Tell me what you have knowledge about. Tell me what your background is. I will give you topics that you can research and, and write about, and I'll even help you get them published because anybody can, can participate in this. And we all know, certainly, especially in today's day and age, we need skeptics and critical thinking more than ever. So anyway, um, do, do we have time for a couple questions or should I wrap up? Susan, I'm looking directly at you. Okay. Anyway, so I am talking a little bit later on. Feel free to corner me. 
Uh, if you have any questions about that, I'll be talking uh, uh, in, in a couple hours. I'll be focusing more on media criticism and fake news. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Ben. That was great. Um, you'll be hearing more about Ben. Visit his table in the back in a few minutes, and he'll be happy to sign books for you. What